Y'all got energy today. I like it. Y'all, you, it, it's because y'all be worshiping like those, uh, like those, those students, those high school students. So, y'all, welcome to Next Gen Takeover. We're so excited. Uh, man, I love seeing what God is doing in the hearts of these kids. I love to see these kids out there. I know Tyler mentioned earlier, but we got kids in the parking team directing traffic. How many had a fender bender this morning? No, I'm kidding. Uh, like we got kids that have been set in chairs. They might be crooked, but man, they look all right to me. I think, I think we have like a six-year-old on the security team with like a Nerf gun or something. I don't know. Um, don't worry. Don't worry. We did not let any of them on the coffee team, right? There's only so far that we'll take it. Uh, we got to get that coffee right. I mean, it's called student ministry for a reason, because every once in a while, we got to let the students do the ministry, right? All right. So as you can see, we've had a lot of younger kids on the stage today. We got some kids right here. Go ahead and say hi, mom and dad. You know, they're not nervous at all. Like this, it, it's just filled with confidence on the stage right now. But here in a moment, we're going to have some of them share. Uh, but before we do, I want to set up why our student and our children's ministries are so important. Right now in America, this is Generation Z population. I got some stats. Can we put those on the screen? Right now, 39% have no official religious affiliation. Only 3% of Generation Z read the Bible every day. 46% don't read the Bible at all. Two-thirds, two-thirds of them are battling with depression. And, and, and one-third of them even battle with those types of thoughts. Y'all, this is Gen Z. Y'all, if you want a little, a little lesson in your generations and stuff like that now, because I know that's what you came here for. Uh, Gen Z right now, if you had to put a cutoff, I know people have already argue, it's sixth grade and up. So this doesn't count you if you're fifth grade or below your generation alpha, but let me tell you, those statistics don't look any better. Look, these stats are scary. These stats are discouraging, but here's the thing. These stats are not going to be true in this church. Can I get an amen? And how do I know that? Well, because the Bible gives the solution. So we got this verse, Psalm 92. I think this is a memory verse that they're doing, uh, maybe in kid life, I don't know. But it says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God, and they will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Look, our dream for this church isn't that the next gen has a great middle school or a great high school experience. Our dream isn't that our, that our children are just going to have so much fun at Kid Life Camp or that VBS, man, they're just going to be having just dancing and having fun. No, our dream is that they are going to have a great life. Look, I am all for athletics. Like my son loves baseball. I love to coach baseball with him. I'm all for academics. I've got kids who are on honor roll and straight and all this stuff like that. But here's the thing. None of those, in none of those ways will a kid flourish like how someone flourish, flourishes when they are planted in his church. Everybody say planted. planted. Look, so in this passage we just read, we talked about a couple of trees. We talked about a cedar tree. We talked about a palm and, and, and Psalm 52 uh, so we talked about a cedar tree, we talked about a palm tree, and in Psalm 52, we actually see an olive tree. Look, I'm no scientist. I'm not a tree scientist. I lo actually looked up what a tree scientist's name was. There's like seven different versions of it, so I don't even know. But whatever it is, I'm not one of those. But what I do know is that all three of those trees are planted. So looking at those trees real quick, we got the cedar tree. Psalm 92, 12. Uh, it says, they will grow like a cedar. Um, now, here's the thing about cedars. Okay, cedars are the strongest and tallest trees around all of Israel. They can grow over 100 feet tall, and they were often seen as a sign of strength or a sign of confidence. So what I'm telling you is that godly confidence, like no other, comes when you are walking out your God-given purpose. 
Look, it's hard to explain, but something happens on retreats. Something happens on mission trips. Uh, and that's just God does the most there. There's something about the change of pace and the change of perspective that opens up our eyes to that God has for us for our purpose. That we have a responsibility to reach our friends, our family with the life-giving message of Jesus in order to see them become fully devoted followers of Christ. Look, I got students who have been best friends with somebody for a year but haven't had the courage uh, to invite them to church. They go on a mission trip and then something happens there on fire and then they come back and they're inviting everybody. Purpose gives you confidence like a cedar tree. So we got the olive tree. Psalm 52, 8, it says, But I am like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. So the secret with an olive tree is that they can live up to 2,000 years, and they're healthy for all of those years. It has to do with what's underneath the soil. Their roots are all, like, interconnected with each other. They share nutrients. They share water. The olive tree teaches us that we have to be planted in community. Like, I have a friend, he's a pastor. He says this all the time. He's like, his parents would never let him miss youth growing up. Like, he, he, it, like if he could fake a cough to get out of school, but if he had a stomach bug before youth, they send him to, there with a barf bag and be like, you're going. Um, and the reasons why his parents didn't let him miss was because they cared about his roots. They wanted him constantly around godly community because they knew it would keep his spirit healthy. And then we got the palm tree. In Psalm 92, verse 12, it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. What does a palm tree have to do with church? I mean, we got like Palm Sunday, right? Uh, But what I think of when I think of a palm tree, besides I think of the time I came back from the mission trip, and brought a ridiculous amount of palm leaves back. Uh, like, I, y'all, side story, not in my notes. So I was going on this mission trip to, to Gulf Shores. Uh, we were going out there to work, and I was asked to bring back palm leaves for Palm Sunday. I had no idea how many, so I'm thinking like six, seven. No, she wanted me to bring 80. <laughs> There's a forest somewhere missing in Alabama right now, okay? Okay. Uh, <laughs> But also I think of um, like the hurricanes, like you ever seen those reporters and the hurricanes and like the winds blowing and like there's like people like holding onto their feet so they're not blown away. All the palm trees are like bent over sideways. They're bent, but they're not breaking. Look, it is easy to see that Satan is trying to break the next generation. But I got good news for you. Look, Satan has an expiration date. God's word does not. And if we are planted in his word, then like a palm tree, when storms and temptation come our way, we may bend, but we will never break. So we're going to get to hear from these students today. Uh, I'm really excited about this. Y'all, these kids have worked really hard. Um, They've gone through this several times. They've written the message, gone through revisions. I've critiqued them up and down. No, I'm kidding. I was really gentle. Um, but these are uh, some incredible students that we have. And I, and I want to start out by saying um, this year when we did talked about Next Gen Takeover, it was really hard to select who was going to be on stage. Uh, it wasn't like I had three obvious people, and I'm like, these are the three. We actually we sat down with some of our leaders, and I had a list of 10 plus of who could do this, uh, to the point where we actually, that was one of the reasons why we decided to do, hey, we're doing three first service, an entirely different three second service, because I had so many uh, who could be up here. Um, so I'm really excited to hear from that, but first up, we're going to have Elijah. Elijah, come on up to the stage. Uh, so Elijah's only been with us for about a year or so, and man, just seeing what God is doing in his life, and uh, the conversations he's been having with his friends about Jesus is incredible. So, Elijah. Howdy. Um, So, I'm going to be bringing a message that I feel God put strongly on my heart from the day that I was asked to speak today. So, before we get into that, let's go ahead and pray. 
Father God, thank you for just allowing us to be able to make it here today. Lord, thank you for just allowing us to be able to live in a country that lets us gather here freely. Lord, please just speak through me today that these words may not be mine, but may be yours. Lord, thank you for just allowing me to be able to get up here. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. See, I really, really feel like this message came entirely from God. Mostly because I wrote it in three days without thinking about it once, but also because it's a message that's about one of the characteristics of God. God is more than willing to give you a second chance. You see, it's found all throughout the Bible that God's giving second chances. One great notable chance is in Genesis 6, when the story of Noah. Uh, at that time, just about everyone had turned to a point of sinning and not caring about God and just not caring what happened after death. When God saw that there was like no one left that still wanted to serve him, he decided to wipe the slate clean and start over. Now, he could have said, that was a bust. I'm starting with the new creature. But instead, he chose to give us a second chance through Noah. God loves humanity so much that he gave us all a second chance even though we don't deserve it at all. Another great second chance can be found in John chapter 8, which is the story of the woman caught in adultery. John 8 says, in front of the crowd, that's not the first slide. (laughs) Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and sat down, and he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What will you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. At that time, the law of Moses was the law of the land. If it said to kill someone, they were killed on the spot, no questions asked. If it said that they were no longer to have hands, their hands were chopped off, easy as that. But these Pharisees wanted Jesus to slip up. They wanted him to have a way of being not God. They wanted something on him that could tell them that he wasn't God. That way he couldn't be who he said he was, and they would still be correct. Instead, Jesus, through his great love, let this woman go. He decided that he would challenge the Pharisees also on the law of Moses, because the law of Moses said sinners are to die. The Pharisees had sinned and knew that they couldn't kill her without having to die themselves. So instead, Jesus decided to give them a second chance by letting them walk away, and the woman a second chance by letting her walk away. Another great second chance, the great second chance, is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. (laughs) Jesus gave us all a second chance. Not one of us deserves to go to heaven because the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Jesus came to die for us when we didn't deserve it, when we didn't earn it, when we couldn't pay for it, and gave us a chance to get back into heaven with him. But why do I feel like this is what God put on my heart? Why did I choose to speak on God being a God of second chances? Because I got a second chance to speak this message. As soon as Tyler told me that he, that he and Michael wanted me to speak this message today, my immediate reaction was to tell him, no, thank you. I don't like to be in front of people. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be on this stage. If I'm going to be anywhere. <laughs> if I want to be anywhere, I want to be in one of those seats right now. But I'm here because God wanted me here. I was completely ready to tell uh, Michael, no thank you, the Wednesday after I learned about Next Gen Takeover. But God wouldn't let me tell him as soon as I decided no. 
God made me sit there and think about it and made me sit there and pray about it. And instead of telling Michael no as soon as I got to church, I went and played football with some of my friends. <laughs> Michael found me before I could find him, and he asked me, he asked me to keep thinking about it and gave me till the end of the night. I was supposed to have an answer by the night before. But God gave me a second chance to make my decision after I had already decided it was a no. Michael gave me a second chance to make my decision, and that's why I'm here today, because God's a God of second chances. Dude, that is so good, Elijah. Yeah, I, uh, I applied the thumb screws. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, thank you so much for saying yes, Elijah, seriously. All right, so next up, we've got Abby. Now, Abby, I'll cheer for Abby. All right, now, Abby, the, Abby's kind of special uh, to me because, I mean, she's kind of special anyway, but, like, uh, so Abby, uh, <laughs> I, I first met Abby in, well, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I had, I had her in seventh grade in my math class. And I had a moment when, um, when she was going over her message on our run-through on Tuesday night and uh, just sitting back here and just watching her, just wa thinking of all the ways that God has grown her. Like right now, Abby is killing it, serving in kid life. Um, so we're really excited. So Abby, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Abby, and I'm a senior in youth. And I'm going to be sharing with y'all what my favorite Bible story is. And that is when Peter first encountered Jesus. And when I think of this story, I think of it as being a very popular one that most of y'all have probably already heard. But to me, it still has a very important meaning behind it. And I'm going to start reading in Matthew 4:18 through verse 20. And it says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And then in Luke 5, verse 5 through 6, it says, Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear when Jesus came up to the brothers, he already knew the problems that they were facing. He knew that they didn't catch a single thing and they were out all night. But that didn't stop Jesus. Jesus was trying to convince Peter just to throw the net out one last time. But Peter wasn't having it. He was like, no, like, for real, I tried everything. There's no hope, not a chance. Well, Andrew then seen that Jesus, the Messiah, was talking to his brother and told him, like, hey, man, you should, you should listen to him. There's a reason he's telling you to do that. And that's when Peter trusted in the Lord and threw that net out one last time. And they couldn't believe what they had seen. There were so many fish that it covered their whole entire boat and more. And after that had happened, Jesus asked the brothers to drop their nets and follow him. And then they did. This story is important because whenever in life you feel like you are so far away from God and you feel like you've tried everything in your power and nothing is going your way, you have to keep that trust and faith in him. In Psalms 37, 5, it says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. To me, that is saying no matter what in life, you always have God. And all you need to do is have that faith and know that he will work on your behalf. You have to commit your life in Christ and stick with him and never give up. Even when you have a specific prayer request and you feel as if your life is crumbling down, you just have to have that faith. And you feel, and it, mm, if you feel like God isn't answering you, he is. He knows the problems that you are going through. He knows the struggles in your life. He sees that. He is moving in your life way more than you can see. God always moves in still moments. Because Peter was convinced that when he threw that net out, there would be nothing. But he decided to have that trust in the Lord. And you may be thinking that Peter just caught some fish and that's all. Well, of course, yes, he did catch some fish. But it also showed him what had happened when he put that faith in Jesus. 
And just like Peter had to blindly throw his net or his trust out into the water, sometimes God asks us to blindly follow him because we can't see the entirety or like the big picture of the plans he has for us. And that's why it's so important for us to have a relationship with him and pray endlessly so he can show us the goodness he has for us. And then Mark eleven twenty four it says, Therefore, I tell you, everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. When you hear God telling you to do something, like something you are called to do, you should definitely do just that. He will push you out of your comfort zone. Like today is one of the most uncomfortable things for me because I'm very nervous, and I was, I'm not a big fan of being up here in front of all y'all. But here I am. And you might think that you shouldn't do what God's telling you to do because it doesn't fit your plans. But there's a reason he's telling you to do that. Mm. <laughs> because I know in my life, God has pushed me out of my comfort zone in the past two months. Um, first, I was asked to serve in kid life. I wasn't crazy about that idea. Uh, for one, <laughs> little kids... <laughs> Little kids, they scare me in a way, you know? Like, I don't... <laughs> um, and I just didn't feel like... I, I didn't see the reason why I had to be in there. But there's definitely a reason. Just, I think it was last week, a little girl came up to me, and I had to pray for her. And what she said hit me. And... It's just those little moments in life that I just feel blessed. Second, I was asked to help lead a life group. And never in a million years thought I would have be able to get that chance to help these younger girls grow in their walk with the Lord. Because when I was their age, I knew God. I didn't know him. I knew of him. And it, that right there has been one of the biggest lessons in my life. And lastly... Well, I was asked to come up here and share my favorite Bible story with y'all. And when Michael first asked me, I was like, <clears throat> pause. I don't know, like, should I just tell him no because I didn't want to? No, that was not the case. I prayed about it and asked God, like, should I do this? If not, tell me. But also, if I should, tell me. And, well, you see it, I'm up here. <laughs> and I'm not going to say I'm not scared and nervous, I am, but I know it's the right thing to do. You have to see the goodness of God in all things and put all your trust in his will for your life. That's all I have. <laughs> you, you can grab my iPad too. We gotta, yeah, just go and grab them both. Just go ahead and grab them both. It's all good. So, <laughs> Colton, do you have an iPad too? No, I'm kidding. Uh, um, Thank you, Abby. That was so good. I feel like there's a reoccurring theme here of me forcing people to be up here. <laughs> I did not force strongly encouraged. Uh, but uh, next up, we got Colton. Uh, Colton is representing, you come on up here, Colton. Colton is representing youth middle. Uh, Colton is, yeah. Uh, man, he is an incredible student, and I cannot wait to see what God has for his future. But Colton, Go ahead. All right. Hi. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Colton Malone. I'm 13 years old, and I go to Pingburn High School. Today, I wanted to talk to you guys about the topic of love, because the world is turning love into what they want to be and not what God has shown us is real love. The world says, follow your heart, and love is love, and do what makes you happy. But the word of God in Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. And in Mark 7, 21 through 23, for from within out the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So rather than follow our deceitful hearts like the world says, we should look at God's standard of love. So I wanted to look to 1 Corinthians 13. But first I wanted to point out that the original Greek language for love in these verses is agape. This agape love is translated 
as goodwill that is sacrificial and divine from God. So with that in mind, we read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. God says you can be a great speaker, a great teacher, a prophet, a giver, but if we do not have God, or if we do not have love as God loves, then we are nothing. The verses continue to define God's agape love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. The world throws around the word love all the time, and yet most of the time, I don't see it being used as God uses it. I don't think they're meeting God's standard of definition of love. People are defiling love with the evil thoughts of our fallen world. 1 John 4, 16 through 19 says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that way we have confidence on the day of judgment. And in this world, we are like Jesus. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. So we must be the example of Christ's love in this world. We must be the ones to show God's true agape love to others, just as he first showed that love to us. The way we, what, what's a good way to do this? Well, 1 Peter 2.21 says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. We do this by following Christ's example and sharing the good news that our faith in him leads to salvation. And even for us out of youth middle, even though we are young, we still look to the word of God so even we can be the example of Christ's love, no matter how old they might be. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set the example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And in Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So we continue to show God's love by imitating him in the proper godly standard. By taking up our cross and following him, by spreading the good news of Christ, by telling people about the gospel, by living our lives for Christ, and by imitating him, by being the example, by being patient and kind, hopeful, truthful, enduring all things, and by showing others what true agape love really is. Thank you. So good, y'all. So good. I want to start with Bryson. So Bryson, come on up here. All right, so Bryson, Bryson's in one of our youth students. Uh, Bryson is a kid who I've seen so much growth, especially in the last year. Uh, I got the privilege of going to Kid Life Camp with him and then serving with him on VBS. I, I want to apologize to Bryson formally, though, because we did uh, an experiment at VBS. All right. And in this experiment, it was about following directions. So I had two different students up here, and one of them followed the directions and made elephant toothpaste, you know, the little foam shot up out of the pitcher or whatever, the beaker. And, uh, and then Bryson was the one that was, did not follow the instructions, and the experiment failed. All right, he did a phenomenal job at that. What I didn't expect was for every kid out there, he was the most hated person at VBS. <laughs> They're like, why didn't you follow the instructions? So, uh, so Bryce, I want to formally apologize 
uh, for that here. But Bryson, go ahead. Morning. Lots of faces out here. Glad y'all you know, decided to wake up and come see me this morning. So I'm going to jump right into scripture. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my name is Bryson O'Neill. I've been going to this church for well over six years now. I've been through kid life, 412, and I'm now in real life. If y'all don't know what those names mean, it's the names of our student ministry. But, you know, whenever you get old, like I am, the generation below you changes things. <laughs> And so now our age groups are called Youth and Youth Middle, but if you want to look at anyone funny, you can look at Chris Smith, who is somewhere in that student section, having a real-life tattoo on his shoulder, and two years later, they changed the name, and, well, that's a lesson for all y'all young folks not to get a tattoo the day before we turn 17. So (laughs) I got the opportunity this past uh, summer to serve at Kid Life Camp, and I'm not going to lie, I only wanted to do it because of my friends, but the day before all the kiddos came... Uh, we had to go to this training. It was supposed to end about 9, 10-ish. Yeah, we were there till almost midnight. But it was so great because I got to hear so many people's testimonies. And just being where I was in life, it affected me so much. Because, you know, you hear Jesus healed a blind man or Jesus healed 5,000 people with two loaves of bread and two fish. But have you ever heard of Jesus healing a 15-year-old boy of death threats and abuse by his own parents? At that time, I hadn't. And it affected me so much because a kid my age was going through something that I couldn't relate to. So in that moment, I got to go up there, put a hand on him, and just pray over him because I know the one person that could relate to it was our father. So through the week, I got to watch all the kiddos go on their walk with Christ, and me and my buddy were together the entire time. It was Logan. And there were some rough patches, a lot lot of rough patches. You know, Michael had to leave in the middle because his wife was having, like, pre-labor slash scaring him, something like that. Y'all can name it what y'all want. But there, there were more adults there. I don't want any wives telling their husbands that their kids can't go to Kid Life Camp next year. But it was, it was a big responsibility to take up because we had to deal with, you know, all the kids and stuff. With that, it leads into one of my favorite verses, 1 Timothy 4.12. It's based off of our 4.12 age group. It says, Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example, example for the believers in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. So the whole theme of Kid Life Camp was... Being a disciple of God. And being a disciple of God comes with those four big things. Purity, faith, love, and conduct. Now, I want to break those down. So first, purity. Purity is having the passion to cleanse ourselves of all the thoughts and desires that aren't holy. It says in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And I get that. What I get by that is we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. So for the second one is faith. Faith is putting our trust and confidence into the Lord and Savior because we have the faith that he, you know, we believe in his scriptures and we believe, you know, we trust in him with all his creations to be true. We cannot physically see him, but we have that faith in him to just continue to follow his path. Uh, My third one is love. Love is how we cannot call upon his love on our own, but we have to let him mature it in us as our walk in him gets, you know, further and further. Now, the last one is conduct. Conduct's a big one I want to focus on because, in my opinion, conduct is what a lot of kids my age struggle with. So a good term I like to use for conduct is behavior. Are you going to be helpful, kind, caring, or prideful, disrespectful, and selfish? Second one is integrity. Are you going to be the same whenever you know, you're not around everyone? Because, spoiler alert, God can see behind closed doors. So Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy 2.15... Do your best to represent yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So if you follow the word of truth, then you will not be ashamed by God and can be approved by him. Now, this is one of my last points, so just bear with me for about a minute or two. One example a good friend gave me, shout out to Alex, was during a time I was going through a lot with relationships and just storms hitting me left and right. And it affected me so much because that timing that she sent me that, it was just the most perfect timing, and I saved it and put it into my notes because in that moment, I believe that's what God sent to her to tell me, and it just meant so much to me. So this is what she said. You need to put your eyes on Jesus and run towards him and then look beside you. Whoever's keeping up with you in your race towards Jesus is the ones that you need to go after because both your priorities are the same. I know you are so on fire for God right now, and you need to be looking for, or not looking for, a girl who has the same intentions 
just as you. Because God doesn't care about what kind of Christians we are on the inside. He cares about what we are on the outside. He cares if you're going to have a girl who will pray with you without stopping, holds the truth in her heart, and does not care about what the world thinks about her. Now, when everything was at an absolute downpour, I had her just like Timothy had Paul. I also have Chris, Michael, Jackson, Morgan, Michaela, and every other youth group leader or youth leader down to kid life all the way up to real life. And I just want you all to know that I am this far in my walk with Christ and built a firm foundation in this church because of y'all. And now, this generation <laughs> focuses on relationships, drama, and just society tells and, you know, wants them to think. But kids like me every day battle with depression, lust, consistency to stay in the Bible, and just getting into the Bible, period. And I believe that if people would have the fire for God and fear in the Lord like I did this past summer, this generation could have such a huge impact in God's kingdom like we haven't seen in centuries. Now, with all that, thank you for listening to a little of my testimony this morning. I believe that the summer of 2023 changes for the better. Thank you all. Whew, so good, Bryson. Man, I love that. And I love watching him grow this past year, like he said. All right, so next up, we got Serena. Serena, come on up here. So Serena, uh, man, Serena has just been someone who I've just got to see grow uh, all through just different ministries. I love watching her and her sister and all of her family serving in VBS. Uh, got to go on the mission trip, had some crazy, awesome stories uh, from Costa Rica as well. But here's Serena. Hi, my name is Serena, and today I want to share with you the beautiful story of Esther, how she became queen, sought after the Lord, and ultimately saved the Jews. This is my favorite Bible story, and I'm excited to share it with you. So let me introduce you to the characters. First, we have my girl, Esther, who was a Jewish woman, a young Jewish woman. Then we have her cousin, Mordecai. Then we have um, King Xerxes, and last, and definitely least, we have Haman, who is very much full of himself. I'm going to start our story in Esther chapter 2 with King Xerxes wanting to find a queen. So how he did this was he sent his people out and to gather women, and he put them through a 12-month beautification process, and basically he just wanted to find the prettiest woman and make her queen. <laughs> it's not really said that the woman wanted to do this, but we do know that they were pushed out of their homes and taken as a possession of the king. Here's, what Esther, this, here's where Esther's story ties into God's plan for her. Esther 2.17 says, The king loved Esther more than any other woman. She won more favor and approval from him than all the other women. He placed a royal crown on her head and made her queen in place of Vashti. Like I said before, Esther was forced into this. It's not like she wanted to. But her having the favor from the king could only come from the God, and, and he was already putting plans into place for her that she did not know about. Now, enters Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai is Esther's cousin. He plays a very important role in her life. When um, her parents passed away, he took her in, and he walked by the palace often to visit her. And he, ca he kind of casually happened to save the king, but we aren't going to focus on that, but it's a pretty cool fact. Okay, let's get through talking about Haman. Now, Haman was not a good guy. He was arrogant and very full of himself. Like, he got one little ward, and all of a sudden, everyone had to start bowing down to him. <laughs> Gosh. So, he made a plan to kill the Jews. A bit of an overreaction, if you ask me. <laughs> but that's what leads us to the story of Esther saving the Jews. Haman went to the king and told the king that there was a group scattered among his kingdom that were not obeying the laws and that they were different from everyone else. And it was not in his best interest to tolerate them. So if the king approved, there would be a law to kill, to kill the Jews, and the king had approved. When Mordecai heard about this, he was overwhelmed with grief. It tells us in the Bible that he tore off his clothes, wore sackcloth and ashes, and went into the streets and cried, cried loudly and bitterly. I don't know about you, but I feel that pain of sadness and fear. Finally, when Mordecai turned to Esther, Esther jumped in with the plan. She was afraid of what, what happened to her, but because if she went, she, she went to the king without being invited, she could have been killed. 
Mordecai says in chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, don't think that you escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. He said that she could stay silent and God would provide another way. He said, but she may be put in this position for such a time, for such time. You can tell that this really spoke to Esther. She went into action with a plan. What's really great about this story is that God had, God had already set up her va favor with the king, and that could only come from God. And God was with her from the beginning and the end. And long story short, the favor went with her, and she was able to write a decree that ultimately saved the Jews. Esther did what others could not do. She went, into the, she went to the king when she could have been killed. She was put in a situation that she did not want to be put through. But instead of running away, she realized that she was there for a purpose. She is proof that when we are placed in hard situations, out of our control, we can trust God that he will use us for his glory. You were put on earth for a purpose in time. God used Esther to speak to people and to spread him whenever he needed her to speak to the Jews and help them for what they were going through. She, he had protected her and them whenever they were going through the times where they could have been killed and that the king wanted to kill them. Our lives can mirror these struggles. It may, we may not be facing life or death situations, but maybe you've been placed in someone's life a similar situation and God is asking you to help them through it. Maybe you went through a hard breakup and you have a friend who's going through the same struggle. Maybe it's anxieties or worries or you're just having a hard time trusting God. You can lean on to him and, you, and God will provide. And God knew God wants to use you. God used Esther to help others with what they're going through. And, that, and he helped her with what her purpose was. Remember that God has a reason and plan for all that we go through. He is going to use you to help others and spread the gospel and spread Jesus if you let him. When we are going through hardships, struggles, or when we just need God's help, we need to do what Esther did and believe that God will be there for us, with us, and will help us through whatever we are going through, and everything will be worked out for good. Amen. So good, so good. I, I love it. Like so, so when students get up here, they get real nervous, uh, and, what, and we always tell them the first thing that goes is their smile. Uh, and I love, and I told Serena, I was like, I don't have to tell you to smile. Like, I know she's going to smile. Like, in fact, when she gets nervous, she might smile even more. <laughs> but we got, uh, next up, we got Jacob. Jacob, come on up here. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell on Jacob here for a second. So when I first asked Jacob uh, to come up here, he was excited. And he told me he already had his outfit picked out. <laughs> he was going to wear a full suit, like Easter, whatever, wedding, uh, whatever. But fish sandals. And if you haven't seen his fish sandals, they are sandals that look like a fish. Um, and when I told him no, I guess he ditched the suit too. Uh, but here's Jacob representing Youth Middle. My parents didn't let me wear the suit. <laughs> My name is Jacob Young. I am in the Youth Middle. And since I'm in eighth grade, that means I'll be in high school next year and be in youth like you and them. So, anyways, I grew up in a Christian household. I was baptized in a horse trough at a shooting range. There we go. I was about like seven-ish. Is that right? About seven? I think so. Yeah. Anyways, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of Jairus. So he was a synagogue leader who had a sick daughter, and sick back then was like almost dead. So he was pretty scared. Um, and he went to Jesus because he had heard of the uh, stories of great miracles. Uh, Mark 5, 23 says, He pleaded earnestly with them, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Jairus had never met Jesus, yet he had this much faith in him that he didn't just ask him to heal her. He said, when you put her hands on her, she will be healed and live. But while they were traveling to Jairus' house, uh, a woman who had been bleeding uh, for 12 years had heard of Jesus and wanted him to heal her of her bleeding. Mark 5, 27 through 29 says... When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. 
Then Jesus asked who touched him. One of his disciples replied with, you're surrounded by people, and you ask who touched you? <laughs> but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Uh, then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. After that encounter, they had continued to head to Jairus' house. When they had gotten to Jairus' house, they had found out the little girl had died. And as a father, Jairus was terrified because his daughter had died. So Jesus said, do not be afraid, for, uh, and, but have faith. And so they entered the house, and they heard a bunch of like weeping and a bunch of noise. Jesus asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She is only asleep. The people laughed at him, but he just made them leave. Um, he... He entered the room of the little girl, and Jesus being Jesus, raised her back to life. We, as Christ followers, need to have this much faith in our walk with Jesus. Jairus had only heard of Jesus through reports, and he had faith to believe that, Jairus, uh, that Jesus could heal his daughter from the dead to life. The bleeding woman had only heard of Jesus through, like, sermons, and he had, she, had, uh, she had believed that Jesus could heal her of her bleeding. And what did Jesus say? Your faith has healed you. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is God's grace in your faith that you are saved. It is God's grace in Jairus' faith that his daughter was raised. It is God's grace in the bleeding woman's faith that she had healed from the bleeding. My main point I want to get to you all is I encourage you to develop your faith so you can receive from God like these people did. If you don't know how to build up your faith, then first... Receive the word, which is what you're doing right now. <laughs> Second, make the word of God final authority. This means put God first, let his will be done. Don't let others distract you from that. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The world will always pressure us to live sinfully and selfishly, but to live the good life of God, we need to change the way we think and put God above all. Three, continually feed on the word and meditate on it, which means read it, think about it all day, share it. Joshua 1, 8 says, keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The key to a prosperous way and the key to good success is meditating on the book of the law, which is the Bible. Uh, meditating on the word of God and being careful to do according to what you read. So what does it mean to meditate? It doesn't mean just read the Bible. It means to soak it in. Uh, four, act on the word. Put God's word into practice. Philippians 4, 9 says, Put into practice what you learned and received from me, both from my words and from my actions, and the God who gives us peace will be with you. This means what you learn and receive from God, you must do in the same in their everyday life. And when you do so, the Lord's peace will be upon you. Five, pray. Simple enough. Pray in your heart, in the word. Even get prayed from others. And I want to wrap this up, and I want to end it the right way with prayer. We were just talking about the importance of prayer, so let me pray over you. Our Father in heaven, even your wisest disciples need the strength to fortify their faith. We pray for the same strength so that our faith in you may never waver. Let us be saved not only by your faith, but by your grace. Let your kingdom be established here on earth. Let your will be accomplished here on earth. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Feel me that. I'll, I'll take it care of it. Man, can we give it up for these students here today? Man, this is hard. Y'all are intimidating. Whew. Man, it's so good. So, uh, man, it was awesome seeing what God did. And I love, I love that last word about prayer. We're going to give you guys an opportunity to do that in a little bit. You know, uh, Jacob talked about uh, Jairus and about the woman uh, with the issue of the bleeding. And one of the things that really stands out to me in this story is that the faith that they had was not the faith that people thought they should have. In fact, they were the least likely to be assumed to have that faith. Y'all, we feel that way sometimes about our students. 
the faith that our students, the faith that our kids, the faith that this next generation has, we might easily write it off. But man, their faith is strong. And God is going to do amazing things because of it. So I want to I ask this, where is your faith? Like, do you have this kind of faith? The kind of faith that we saw from these kids today? The kind of faith that we see from Jairus? The kind of faith that we see from the woman with the issue of the blood? And if not, God can grow that. God can strengthen your faith if you ask him. So I want to do this. I want to, I want to have everybody close their eyes, bow their heads. I want to pray over you guys. Um, but I want to ask this question right here. How many of you need God to grow your faith? How many of you would honestly say, my faith is not where it should be? Not necessarily it should always grow more, but where it is right now. I've been a Christian for 18 years, but I don't have the faith of a Christian that's been a Christian for 18 years. And you need God to move. If that's you. Would you raise your hand? All eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. There's hands all over the place. Father God, I pray that you be with every single person in this room that is reaching out to you, Father. Would you strengthen them? Would you increase their faith? Would you help them to grow in the areas they need to grow? Help them to put on the full armor of God so that they can stand true and stand strong in your word against all the forces of the enemy and all the forces of darkness that is coming against them, that they are going to stand on it. And then through that, Father, you will do a work in their lives, Father. Their faith will grow as they trust and they see and they believe, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I also want to do this one other thing as well. So if you guys just close your eyes again, because what, he said that verse, Ephesians 2, 8, for, by faith you have been saved through grace. Maybe you that's not you in here. Maybe you're in here and you've never made that decision. And you know what? It is the voice of a child and seeing their heart and seeing their faith that God has put on your heart that that needs to be you. And if that's you, I just want to give everybody a chance to respond. If I have one person, if I have 10 people, if I have no people, that's okay. But I always want to give God a chance uh, to move and for people to respond. So if you're in here and you've never made that decision, but today is the day, I want to pray with you. So again, all eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. If you need that in your life, if you're ready to make that decision, would you raise your hand? I see you. I see you over there. If that's you, just pray something like this. God, I need you. God, I cannot do this on my own. I know the wages of my sin. I know that there is no way that I can be that pay the price that I owe to be with you for all eternity, Father. But you died so that I could. You paid the price that I couldn't pay. Thank you for that. And Father, from this day, from this day on, you are not just my Savior, but you are my Lord. And I say yes to you every day when I wake up, every morning. It's yes, Lord. What, what is it that you would have me do? Father, I love you in Jesus' name. Amen.